it's a long process learning how to table. Like I still think back to like my first couple cons and how frightened I was and how, uh, you know, how unacceptably aggressive it felt at the time to like directly address people that were walking by, you know, it's just like, it's just like so assertive. Like I can't do that. Um, but you just learn it over time. You just learn it. You learn what works for you. Welcome back to Inspired Inc., the CWS podcast, a show where we promote indie comic creators and become inspired by what they create and their journey of creating it. I'm your host, Brandon Blockstorff, and today on the show, we have creator Clara Meath joining us, and we talk about figuring out how to survive and keep your mental in check as a creator, the real difference between patience and putting time aside for your craft, and her advice to have success when tabling. All this and so much more on today's Inspired Inc. You're you're at it. Like I feel like do you even have time for a day job for like what you're pouring into your art? No, I don't have time for anything. Um <laughs> but I do way too much and it's just pretty much constant. Um there's kind of a light at the end of the tunnel now, but it's just creating the opportunity to do more work, you know? So Oh yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, it's constant. Yeah, between the I mean, before I worked at a grocery store full time, and then I did this contract work, and then I was doing the publishing stuff, and then I'm working on my own comics. It was just like a never ending battle of like, when do I get a free moment to like, just breathe, like, yeah. <laughs> just think for a little yeah. bit. Um, yeah. How many projects do you have lined up for you at this moment that you work on? Oh, gosh. Um, let's see. I am my current primary obligation is the perspective course I'm doing for my publisher at Comics Experience Publishing. That's what I was working on right before I got on here. Uh, I'm getting close to the filming stage of that. Basically, they have a side platform where they like teach a comic school in, you know, in, in video mediums, basically. And um, so I'm putting together a video course teaching perspective based on one of the uh, panels I like to give at cons. I put a lot of work into it and I'm very proud of it. And I pitched it to him and like, hey, can I do this as a book? And he's like, I'll do you one better. Let's do a book and a video course. And hopefully you make some passive income that way. So when I have that ready, I'm going to kickstart it. And we'll see how that goes. Um, no real expectations in that field because that's not a popular subject because it's hard. Uh, it but is. we'll see. We'll see. Um, the the uh, the people mature enough to recognize what they need for their work will, will come, yes. I hope. I was going to say, um, like, it's such a vital aspect. And like, yeah. as an early artist, that I'm trying to learn how to draw and do stuff like it's something I'm like, I need to figure that part out because it's just yeah. something that's daunting. And it's hard to find good resources for something like that, too. It is. It's ridiculously hard to find good resources for that. And I don't know why. So I'm trying to sort of be that very simple you know, not too many syllable words sort of introduction to these are the very basics. And even if you just know the basics, like I only used the basics for the, you know, for years and years and you, that's, that'll still get you by. So, um, yeah. And after that, I have some mini comics I'm working on. I have a pile of commissions I got to get to. I'm helping my business partner, Zach Howard, a lot with, uh, his project Moonshine Bigfoot, which is going so beautifully, um, recently ordered, you know, some of the black and white, um, or rather the full print run of black and white, uh, you know, exclusive limited series, uh, issue ones from you guys. So yeah, I got him on board. We got all kinds of stuff from you guys. Oh, sick. That's super awesome. Yeah. And you know, even with like the timing with stuff, I know this new facility is taking a minute for us to like acclimate and spit out orders, but like the quality control and stuff is just so much better too. I'm mm -hmm. so excited for people to see what like our new square bound machine can do. And like, even oh. our single issues, like imperfections are like almost like minuscule now, like, oh. like, yeah, like less than 2% of all of our books are having errors now, which is, I mean, I think it's exciting for creators to like not have to send back anything with like reprints or like, right. fix, you know, you know, stuff on the spine and things like that. So right, right. I feel like any of the most recent orders, like it takes a, a little bit to get through our system as we catch up, but the quality, sure. I think it's just going to be pushing any books another level at this point, which is rad. I think it's what we all need to really re represent our work. If I can be a nerd, tell me about the new square binding machine. How is that different? And like, what's what's new? Um, we could actually like the way this machine works, from what I understand, is that you could even do like a school perfectly square, uh, perfect bound book for like even eight pages. 
And all you got to like watch out for is like your margins to make sure the letters aren't cutting out. Right. And the glue has been upgraded. So the shelf life and the usability on your books is even better as well. Um, okay. I forgot that it went from like EVA to like some other glue. But uh, yeah, it's like just the quality behind how it's packaged and put together mm -hmm. and how it's glued. It's just going to make your books a whole lot healthier, which I'm nice. hyped um, because my last two books that I'm waiting to get in, hopefully, I think they're getting sent this week finally. Um, but I did a anthology for uh, the Shadow Anthology, Dark Side's Calling, and then CyberSync. Um, they're both perfect bound books. So once I get those in, that's going to be my real test to show off and kind of see how everything looks. Because one is about 80 pages, one's about 110. Um, and one of them even has a foil cover that I'm really excited. Oh, wow. Like pieces of it. It's this really cool purple that this uh, guy, Abel Rodriguez, did. And um, we highlighted the purple foil. And it's it's going to be so cool. I'm so excited to, you know, you're waiting for your book to get in your hands finally. Right, when it's existed right of course. So it's long. so exciting. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those things, you know, comics are interesting that like, I've I only have one book technically published right now, my punk anthology up here. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have like eight books like out. They're just like not like printed and in hands yet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're just like in that limbo phase where they exist and they're like about to hit that either kickstarting or that like going to print. So I'm like, I just want all my books out and in front of me. But it's it takes like a year practically from production to like putting it out. Um, right. It's super exciting. I'm super hyped for it. Cool. <laughs> Awesome. Um, but I mean, like, what about you? Like, you know, with, you know, printing with CWS and doing the amount of work uh, like that you do, like, what do you look for when you're getting your book in your hands? Like, are you someone that analyzes like every aspect of the paper quality and like super technical stuff like that? Or are you just happy that your book is printed and like able to distribute? I think for me, it comes down to, I mean, obviously the quality of the book, of course, but that's never been a problem with you guys. And I think it's mostly ease of use and options, you know, that the, the feeling of autonomy that comes with options that you can choose the paperweight and that you can choose, you know, the covers and, and I haven't even made use of a lot of your other options, like the sketch cover or, you know, the, the trifold or whatever it's called. And I'm looking into like, well, how can I up my game? Cause you know, comics wellspring offers all these super cool things. So I'm trying to, trying to move into that. And I've used a few other printers earlier on in my career and, you know, just the quality was more spotty and you didn't have, you know, those, that array of options. And you guys are also super easy to work with. You know, you're super communicative, you know, like the email proofs and stuff are always like, I mean, at this point, you know, at, at the level of interaction I'm at now, they're always like very personal, like, hi, Clara, here's your proof kind of thing, you know, but like, even when I was just starting out, it was, you know, it was, not informal in a bad sense, but informal, kind of friendly, just kind of like, yeah, I hope you like your proof and let us know if you need any changes whatsoever. So it was always, you always feel like you're dealing with a real person. You're not dealing with that annoying phone tree kind of thing. There's no robots involved. And that's, that's what I like about it. And you're super reliable in, with your delivery as well. And the whole, you know, return any damage kind of thing has been great. And that's, there's been so little damage, but the few instances were like, Oh, okay. I can just, you know, send these back. It's easy. Yeah. You guys have been great. Rad. That's super awesome to hear. I love hearing the, like, you know, the consistency from whenever, like I asked her and like, you know, I poke my head in to see how CWS operates and has been operating. It's always been very consistent on that, you know? And I think that's why when we encounter a hiccup, like we are right now, so many people are like outraged or like thrown off because we are very consistent, it seems like. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, well, we gotta, we, we slip for a minute, but we gotta like get back on track, which it's fun because again, you know, pulling indie people to like help represent indie I think it's more comfortable for everyone. It takes away that like corporateness away in a sense and kind of bring back that punk rock vibe. You know, we're all the same people. We're all on the same team. We're all yeah. just trying to put out cool comics and whatnot. Um, I love that. It's, it's encouraging for me too, as a comic book creator, I suppose, uh, to just know you have a team and community behind you, um, mm -hmm. which you've, you've really formulated too. Like just looking at your social media and like how just blown up you are um, and the quality you're spinning out, like, where did all this start from? Like, where did your artistic journey even begin? I mean, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> as far back as you want. I'm super curious. I mean, I was always one of those kids that drew and I just drew a lot. Um, there's some quote, I forget what it was. It like kind of like everyone draws as a kid. Some of us stop drawing. 
you know, yeah. and I just kind of never really, th- I honestly, I did stop for a while because I wanted to be very intentional about like my late teens. I intentionally stopped drawing because at the time I wanted to be uh, a writer. Um, mm. and you know, once I, once I realized that I could do both, that I've always drawn and I've always written and I could just make a career out of both of those, uh, that was kind of the real turning point for me. And then I went to art school and I started my Instagram while I was in art school. And that's been riding pretty high ever since, honestly. I, I can't quite account for it, except that I post regularly. And I think people like the aesthetic of, you know, watching traditional art be made. Um, yeah. Do you ever get in that like rut where you're like, I'm stuck in this head zone, but I need to shift gears, but it's really difficult yeah. to pull out of a spot? Yeah. I mean, I've been in that headspace for about two years now. It's a it's a very difficult thing to buck um, because I I did not plan well financially. Those of you that, that know me out there have heard this story before on my Instagram and whatever. But <clears throat> basically, when I finished Mother 47, my most successful graphic novel so far, my most successful creator own book, very, very happy with it. Haven't gotten a single negative word about it, which has been a huge honor. Um, I realized I had put every scrap of my attention in that and had not planned anything after it. So suddenly I found myself kind of unemployed. I still had a bit of Kickstarter money for, you know, a few months, but I, I really, you know, that doesn't give me enough time to start something new that's going to actually make money. So I was like, crap, what do I do? And my, again, my business partner, Zach Howard had been saying for a few months at that point, why didn't you just move out here to Denver? Cause I was in Sioux Falls at the time oh, and cool. you can work at my wife's vet clinic to get yourself back on your feet. And, uh, the difficulty with starting back up a regular job is that it's, you think you can just like do this for a few months, get the money and get back on it. But what you forget is that once your brain is in that different mode, it's so hard to switch back to creating. And I'm like super introverted and like that much autistic. So it's like just being out in public takes so much energy. Like at the end of the day, when it's like, I technically have an hour or two to make something, I'm completely dead. And it's like, so it's been a very rough uphill battle trying to, and I don't want to imply even in the slightest that I'm ungrateful for this wonderful opportunity because it's allowing me to, you know, pay off my uh, debt and my student loans and all that stuff. So that's been super useful, but I'm finally clawing my way back into, you know, getting back on that career horse. I got the, this mini comic planned. I'm I'm hoping to do, you know, a, uh, a set of three mini comics sort of printed together. Um, I've got, uh, I'm working on this perspective course that also I'm going to kickstart. So hopefully that's enough money to start taking time off at the clinic so I can actually start making comics again. And, um, like it's at first I was downright embarrassed because I was like, I was a completely art supported artist for years, Mm -hmm. just living on my own, just making it happen, supporting myself with art but I didn't plan well enough. And, uh, so now I'm having to deal with the consequences, which is, it's a hard lesson, but I think it's a very necessary lesson. And, um, at the end of the day, I'm grateful that I'm having to go through this because it's a really good slap on the wrist is like, don't let this happen again. Mm -hmm. So I already have a whole system set up where I basically always have something ready to go. Now I'm not going to, again, put myself in the position of not having work lined up when I finish a project. So I don't even remember where that explanation started, but that's my current situation. (laughs) No, I mean, and that's a lot to unpack there too, because, you know, for one, like a vet clinic is like a really intense job too. You know what I mean? There's like a lot. yeah. Yeah. Like it seems like, you know, you're dealing with a lot of like animals and there's a lot that goes through that doors. I'm sure that you have to like kind of cope with and like, you know, mentally channel through at that point too. And that's just like Mm -hmm. animal handling. That's not even dealing with the people at that you know, essence right. too. like not even taking that on. There's a lot that goes into stuff like that. I've had friends who do clinical stuff for vets and it, I know it, it gets really rough sometimes. Yeah, um, so I, I mean, you know, coming home and then being like, Oh, I get to be creative in myself. It's you're exhausted. I mean, finding that right. energy to like put your best work out there at the same time, it's uh, right. it's draining, you know? And I think right. that's where a lot of us are just like, man, even if I do like half an hour, 15 minutes of something while well, my worst days, it's at least some progress, but even that seems like the hardest task. And I don't think a lot of like 
normal people realize that like we don't right. all go home and get to turn on tv and to like kick back and enjoy no. it. we go home and start our other job and try to balance all this out and still deliver at our other occupation as well um yeah so there's a lot to take in there there just alone. well you get like you get all this like you know, when you go to cons and stuff, people want to, you know, this is where they have their fun nerd time and they want to talk about, have you seen this? Have you seen this? Have you read this? And I'm like, I can't, I can't articulate to you just how little time I have. Like I haven't had a moment that wasn't full of something that was absolutely necessary for like two years. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's absolutely brutal. Um, and I, you know, and at first, at first I really beat myself up. Like, why is this so hard? Just do it. And I, and uh, Zach again, you know, said like, you know, you don't really don't beat yourself up about that. Like mm -hmm. creative work takes so much emotional energy. Like he, he likes to say like he's had, cause he used to do a lot of rugby. He's like, I've had rugby matches that were less exhausting than one day of making comics. I was yeah. like, okay, okay. That sounds actually that. That's the first thing I've heard that has gelled with my experience, as opposed to all the people who've never made any kind of drawing in their life. And are like, why can't you just do it super quick and be done? It's like, yeah. no, I want it to be good. It has to be good. There's no point in doing it if it's not going to be good. And that's yeah. my my biggest stance, I think. Oh, I totally feel you on that, um, especially yeah. as someone who's like learning how to draw right now. And I'm trying to like get to a point where I can make my own like, you know, mini comics and whatnot. You know, I'm basically mm -hmm. essentially a writer, but I'm trying to get all my skill sets going. Um, yeah. But it's one of those things where it's like, you know, when you're attempting to put stuff on a page and you're so self-critical about yourself, too, like I'm super self-critical about anything I start putting on and, mm -hmm. you know, having the energy to like visualize and put into practice and like work through it because, you know, even warming up your hand and like getting used to like what you're working with and having it come mm -hmm. out, that is just so mentally draining sometimes that your yeah. hand hasn't even done anything yet. Like you haven't right. even started and you're already exhausted right. before you sit down. You like, you know, psych right. yourself out sometimes. But yeah. people don't get like, you have to really find a channel and a vibe and a zone and like yeah. go into that and, you know, just let it wash over you. And th that's another thing is that when you get too involved, that can start impacting your day job because now you're up too late and now you're not going to get sleep right. and now you're right. drained for your work day, which is going to drain you right. for the evening that you wanted to work. And it's like this domino yeah. cycle you have to kind of plan for that. Yeah. I had one great yeah. day. Let's hope for more. But it's it gets rough. It's super rough. And in this economy, like, are any of us okay? You know? No. Like, no. No. <laughs> and again, yeah. I'm working super... Since I have this this very generous and kind safety net I have right now. Like I, my, my landlady is a work friend. So my, my rent is very low for the area. Um, you know, I have the support of Zach and his wife. Like, you know, I will never, I know I can't go hungry because I have them and stuff like that. So basically everything I make goes straight to get rid of the student loan and get rid of all this stuff. Just like get rid of it because after that you have creative freedom, you know, like yeah. your money, as much as I hate it having to be about money, it is about money because money is how you buy creative freedom. Money is how you buy a peaceful day where you can just draw and make actual progress on your book. So I'm, I'm trying to take, you know, the energy I still have while I'm young and really push through this hard period so that I have the rest of my life to make stuff, you know? Yeah, no, that's a great outlook. And that's like, the harsh truth that it's hard for anyone to kind of accept and follow you know what i mean like we yeah. all say it's not about you know we're not in this to make money and we're not in this to you know all this stuff but in the long run we're in this to make money to survive as an artist you know right. like that's right. like the bottom line we all want at a certain right. point um exactly and you got to pay rent you got to eat you got to feed you got to feed the cats you know what i mean like all sorts of stuff like it's yeah. just a, in the cycle of you can't escape it so you got to figure out how to make it work for you in the best yeah. benefit. And student yeah. loans just suck. I hate, I mean, yeah. I'm it's, in debt and up it, to my neck in them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those things. It's like, it's often hard to validate even to yourself, which is why I started doing those uh, daily work reports on Instagram. Oh, I love just those. for my, just for my own mentality and for, uh, and, you know, kind of, kind of to yell at other people to be like, no, 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 
I'm busting my ass every second. I want you to realize this. These days are so full. Like I haven't had a not 15 hour long day in longer than I can remember. And it's yeah. just, it's just like that, but I am getting closer. It is coming. It's getting there. Do you feel like you're like getting closer to just replace it with other things though? Or do you feel like you're getting closer to actually have like downtime? Downtime is not on the menu right now. Um, and I mean, I do, I, I know, I understand my, you know, my own mental health needs enough that downtime has always been part of you know, part of the schedule. Like I do oh. have a little bit of time every night where I just like wind down, read. Sometimes I like, you know, watch a show or something, but I try not to do evening screens. It makes a big difference in my life. Um, but yeah, that's to an extent, that's always been the part of it. Actually like taking, you know, like a vacation or something that's, that's uh, nowhere on the horizon. I don't know but what that is. Someday. <laughs> yeah, I, I really don't. Do. I try to, I try to pretend cons are vacations, even Same. though they are they're more exhausting than a normal day, but at least it's in a positive way. At least it's in like the over the sense of overwhelmed is not from, I have so much work in front of me and I don't know how I'm going to process this. And I'm going to go broke in two days, you know, every two days it's that again, you know, but it's like, but uh, at a con, at least the stimuli is positive. People are like, well, let me buy this. And I like your stuff. And let me, let me regale you about some completely unrelated thing, but you can tell they're just so happy to be there, you know? So yeah. it's exhausting, but at least in a good way. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, every time I, you know, I, I was working at full time at a grocery store for a long time. And it was one of those things where I'd ask for, you know, so many times off to like go to a convention and they're like, Oh, cool. You get to go and have fun and relax and have a good time. But then like, I'm there doing interviews, I'm doing live stuff, I'm capturing stuff. I'm trying to like right, of also promote my own work at the same time and give out copies and trade work and schedule yeah. things. And you're like, oh, that was my, that was my weekend off. And now I'm back to nine days straight. Cause I had five right, days off. Right. You know? like, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, no it's not, it's not a break at all. It's just a different kind of work. It's, it's fun work, but it's like, yeah. And people who don't do that have really no sense of how it works. Like no shade at all. There's no reason they should, but it's what, like, I remember I had a friend in comics once who was like, oh, uh, you know, a friend of mine who's not in the arts at all heard I was going to be in her city because I was at a con. She was like, oh, we should get lunch that day. And he was like, you don't understand. I don't, you don't bring me you're lunch. lucky if you get to eat a bunch of French fries really quickly behind your table, like hidden under your tablecloth, you know, like you're lucky if you get that, you know, yeah, that's a con. It's a hustle. How do you how do you take on tabling? Like, what's your approach? Where do you find you find like success? And like, what do you not like about tabling too? It's a long process learning how to table. Like, I still think back to like my first couple cons and how frightened I was and how, you know, how unacceptably aggressive it felt at the time to like directly address people that were walking by, you know, it's just like, it's just like so assertive, like, I can't do that. Um, but you just learn it over time. You just learn it. You learn what works for you You learn how to treat people. Um, like, like you, I worked in retail for a long time. I worked at Trader Joe's for eight years and you really learn in, in retail. And I strongly believe everyone who possibly can should work retail at least for a little while, because that'll teach you what you need to know about humanity and how to interact with people. But, really uh, <laughs> that I got the retail skill there of learning how someone wants to be talked to, you know, within the first point, you know, seven seconds or so of interaction. Um, but for the most part, my basic rules, I just kind of treat everyone like my potential new best friend and mm -hmm. act like I'm excited about my work and that I want them to be excited about it too. And that often goes really well. Uh, you know, even when, even if they don't buy things, my, my motive is that they see my work. It, it still means as much as it practically shouldn't, it still means more to me when people see my work and smile than if they bought something, you know what I mean? Like, it's still like, it is art. It exists to be seen. That's its primary function. If it also makes you money, well, good for you. But the positive reactions are what fuels me. Oh, that's great. I mean, that's the best thing you want out of something like that too, is to like kind of inspire somebody else too, you know, like we do mm -hmm. this, you know, art is kind of a selfish thing because it's something we need to get out and it's built into our system. And, you know, a lot of us can't function unless we do it. But like, you know, the reward we get for doing that like service to ourselves 
and giving it to someone else and having someone else like see yeah. it and love it and be like, I want to get to that point. Or, you know, I wish I had money to give to you to support you. That's yeah. like awesome enough in general. Cause that means you're yeah. impacting them enough to be like, Oh man, they actually like want to, they can't, but they will love to do support me somehow. Um, if it's not now, it's maybe a follow and it leads to another thing and it's a future investment, you know, but having mm -hmm. that impact to someone can just change someone's life and day. Because if you met somebody that was a jerk at like an indie table, you'd be like, man, I don't know if I want to go back to those tables because they all kind of seem like jerks, even though it was only one or two people, but that impact you make with that person monumentous and it could bring them back to indie areas and it could bring them you know so many conventions segment indie right. creators from everyone else we want to find more reasons for people to go there and we don't want to be jerks and have them chase away to like the popular tables you know we want to bring them over here to indie and make them the popular tables and right. get rid of this you know high school click thing that cons do yeah. to us sometimes yes that's a like a very good point that's something i often don't even like I don't directly think about it like in a categorized sense, but it is true that like I I feel a sense of responsibility to keep this field dignified, I guess, because mm -hmm. you get so much like I hate to say it. I wish it wasn't true. You get so many idiots who can't treat other humans with even a modicum of decency in this industry. And it's so odd. I think it's just a personality type that people tend to be who go into comics. I know many people in comics that are absolutely delightful, but yeah. I've encountered so many more that are just like, you act like you hate this and you hate everyone around you. So maybe do something else, you know? Yeah, why like, are you here? <laughs> like, yeah, why are you're you making us all look worse. This is already like the least popular art form. <laughs> <laughs> that makes the least money has the most constant upheaval and drama within it and it's like can you at least like scrape yourself together enough to behave like an adult like i i feel i do feel very strongly about that like you have the ability to make the industry look better or worse based on your behavior and the better it looks the better it is for you and everyone in it oh mm -hmm. kitty cat tail yeah, this is uh this is Booby Belvedere. He's uh Oh he's, he's, hi there. Uh, when when he walks up, he wants kisses. And I'm like, Booby, yeah. you know, we're gonna we'll hang out in a little bit. Um dude, that's that's such a big vital thing. And I think that's like what a lot of people miss out on. And I think we're, you know, so many creators are introverted and just like yeah. by themselves the whole time working on their craft that they lose yeah. focus of like what they're doing and what they're doing it for. And it's like to serve the audience and it's to serve the people. I always, you know, think about storytelling as survival information. Like I'm passing on stuff that I've experienced and go through mm. and I'm giving you survival information of some sort. And it could be like yeah. just a mindset, a way of thinking, you know, the, the way I position right. stories, it's meant to give you some clarity into something in yeah. life at some aspect and experience, you know? And if you're not passing along that survival information and, you know, also giving them the benefit that like they're a good person behind it it kind of crumbles a lot it's like when we hear about an artist that turned out to like not be a good person it kind of like you question right. like how you want to like support their work you question right. on like you know do i support the stuff i like before i realize they're like this do i you know right. just you know support not support their future work but that impacts people how you act and how you treat people is gonna yeah. define your career at a certain extent and yeah. I've seen people writing up, you know, getting signed into bigger publishers and doing bigger books for, you know, like even Power Rangers and stuff like that. And then something happened to them um, because they said or did something and their whole right. career is crumbled. So it's like right. years and years that you've worked towards this and you just mess it up for being a jerk. Like, right. no, right. It, it hurts, you know, and it's like, you yeah. got to be nice for even if it's and like, like, yeah. And I like and I get it. I, get, I am not. I have no natural inclination towards any sort of social capabilities, but like I realized early on, it's like you have to develop these skills mm -hmm. because this is vital for your career and you have to figure out how to talk to people, which I still hate doing to this day. I hate it, but it was like that part of me is so silenced now. It's just like, well, okay, you're, you're on. This is yeah. part, part of the job is this performance. And, uh, and I, I get the impulse to not do that. I understand that but you do it anyway. 
Yeah. You got to do it. Well, it's about being a professional to an extent too. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people define professional in a lot of different ways. Um, but essentially it's like, you know, doing your craft, even when you don't want to. And part of doing your craft when you don't want to is like respecting your fans and respecting yeah. the people that support you. That's part yeah. of like, I don't, you know, sometimes I interact with people that I'm like, I don't think I want to be your friend, but thank you so much for like right. buying my book, for coming by this table, for doing this. Right. You know, we may not click on a lot of reasons or views and stuff like right. that, but that doesn't matter. This is about art and this is about sharing art. And if you come up to me and you say you enjoy something that like I drew or I made, dude, thank you. Like yeah. I have no reason to be cruel or mean or rude because you're here supporting me. This is, right. that's, it's, it's a transactional thing in that sense. Like I'm not yeah. doing anything for them. Like they're right. doing stuff for us. Why would we yeah. act like that? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. They're, they're supporting you. They're the ones helping you out. Yeah. Yeah. Just keeping that in mind, I think has helped me a lot. And it, and again, it took years. Like I was, I was telling Zach on the drive home. So we just went to, we usually go to cons together because we're those kind of business partner dorks now. But, uh, we, uh, we just came back from, uh, Wicked West Comic Expo in Loveland, Colorado, which oh. was a delightful show. <laughs> Um, and on the way back, I was observing like, you know, Zach, I think this was the first show I've ever been to that I wasn't like in physical pain by the time it was done just for being so tense the whole time. And it's just, I've learned to manage, you know, my anxiety and my stress processing well enough that that no longer, you know, destroys me, but I've been doing it for eight years you know, it, like it takes time it, and practice. Like it takes experience. that long, especially if you're, you know, one of us and you just don't function that way. My, the line that always gets a laugh for whatever reason, I do kind of like it is that, uh, I, I describe conventions as, um, designed for a personality type that does not exist, <laughs> which is like, you're going to take all these people whose ambition in life is to hide in their basement and make cool drawings. And then you're going to make them stand in front of complete strangers who are probably also equally awkward for two to three days straight trying to sell their stuff. And it's like, what? It's putting them how, out there, shoving them into this... the wolves. <laughs> yeah. Like it's like, it's, it's ridiculous that this is the, you know, that this even ever works as well as it does, which is often not even well. Yeah, that's true too. And you know, conventions are one of those things where it's a hit or miss. You don't know if you're going to, do well right. you don't know if it's going to slump if you're going to have success and that's another aspect to take in not only the people but like yeah. the business side of comics where like oh i'm here i paid for a table i got to try to at least recoup some table and hotel costs and you know make that type of movement so it's like there's a lot of pressure that goes under that um umbrella when you're at a at any convention you know even if you're yeah. just visiting like you want to be successful and not put yourself in a hole to where it makes it impossible for you to do that ever again. Right. So you've got to right. find those like moments and those key things to like, make sure you're doing enough to even just, and you know, flat, you just make enough to cover your costs, you know, and that right. can be a challenge in itself. It can. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and another thing I would just throw out there, cause it just came to mind was like, don't, um, don't be intimidated by other people's setups. Like you do have to do what works for you. Your setup is, you know, it's like your art style. It is unique to you and do what works for you and promote what actually sells for you. I spent a long time trying to push things that I wanted to sell. And it's mm. just like, it doesn't work that way. Like lean into what you actually have that works for you. And I'm at a point where I'm like, I occasionally sell knickknacks and stickery things, but it's almost entirely books, oh, which cool. I mean, at the end of the day is good. Uh, you know, that is what I got into this to do to sell books. And I did technically just start a deal with a friend of mine on Instagram who does screen printing to do bags and or tote bags and shirts. But you know, if that doesn't pop off, I'll stop doing it. Yeah. You know, and I may have been doing this for long enough that that might pop off, but it might not. And it's trial and error and accepting the information you're getting. It was like, look, this is what sells. This is what doesn't. The tricky thing with cons is that different things sell at different shows. So yeah. you've got to develop an awareness of like, what is, you know, what are the demographics? You know, how many people are young? How many people are old? You know, is this, is this a town with a lot of reading? Or is this more a town where you're going to sell, sell stickers and decorations and stuff? Like it, there's, a billion variables so there's even less point in trying to imitate somebody else's cute setup when you just need to do you 
And I think about it a lot, like growing up as a musician and going to shows and, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you don't start off like being Kiss right away. You don't have all the pyrotechnics and the lights and the, like the, the wall of amps and all that. Like you got to start small and you got to figure out your way up there. You start off in the garage, you know what I mean? And then you right. kind of build upon your setup until you could do the, you know, even Kiss had fake amps with no speakers in them for a long time. And it made it look right. bigger than it was find right, ways right. to like you know make your setup look great but like don't like compare yourself to the person across who has this giant sure. you know extravagant banner and like you know a sure. stage prop and cutouts and all that like again it comes in time it comes in experience it comes by like figuring out what you want it's kind of like buying all the art equipment you know you could possibly want and dream of a desk and all the pencils and pens and markers and you know ipad right. and everything and then you're like oh this is my first week drawing and you're like, what? Right, like right. why do you need all that? Just start with a pencil and paper, dude, like, and build, yeah. make sure this is what you want and then start going yeah. towards that. And it's, it's so organic. <clears throat> I, I would just say at the end of the day, that's what you got to remember. It's so organic. The cons themselves are like, they're living things with, with recognizable lifespans. You can kind of understand, you, you get the feel of a con when it's in its youth, when it's starting to age, it goes corporate and then it dies. And that's sort of, you know, how the natural progression of a con and you got to judge, you know, gauge where a con is in its lifespan as a, as a living creature, as this weird kind of dinosaur. Um, another thing I've been, you know, pushing with myself lately is like, this, it's not just for money making, it's for networking. You are not in competition mm -hmm. with these other people. You are supporting mm -hmm. these other people. You're supporting each other. This is a this is a chance for you to support each other. Yeah, any sense of competition you should have should be out the window. And I try, and as, like, as exhausting as it is, I try to make a point to make at least a few rounds and buy at least one thing from one other creator just so that I could know I could. Just, you know, just... Not so much because of reputation, but it's more just like that thought in my mind was like, I don't want to be the person who came here and didn't help anyone except myself, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, for sure. and it, you know, if you give, you get back kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm at like, and I have now relationships with so many like local vendors that's just like, whenever we see each other at shows, it's like, ah, you know, hey, good to see you, you know, hugs, what's new, what can I buy? But they, they respond in kind, they will do the same thing for you and you're mm -hmm. you're creating a positive environment which is like we need to focus so hard on doing that because again there's so much crap in this industry <laughs> yes and i mean dude that's a key thing networking and utilizing that ability to network because you can open each other up to different audiences that way too like whatever like you know maybe somebody on that is a fan of yours isn't a fan of mine and vice versa right. but like it could be the same thing like somebody doesn't like my stuff they might like yours so if i could promote your stuff and if someone right. discovers you because they're like i was really attracted to that like it looked awesome i got to check it out that's beneficial yeah. and that's indirect like helping each other out and you know, we are all like essentially in a giant stadium holding up our, our comic to the single person on stage to like, right. you know, I want you to buy this. And we're all shouting to that one person. And that's how it feels sometimes at conventions. But at the same time, yeah. like we're all different styles. We're all like our own stories or our own, you know, people. So there really isn't competition. The only competition you have is with yourself and putting out that work and continuously putting out that work. Like you're more yeah. on a race against how much work you can create and how many stories you can complete than you are mm -hmm. to like compete with sales, you know? I don't yeah. think any of us are trying to like fight over like, oh, you took that customer's five bucks. That could have been my five bucks. Right. Yeah. It's no. It can impact you. <laughs> Yeah. Never think that. No, that doesn't help you. We, when we win in this, we win together. It's a small enough industry that we're kind of at the end of the day, we're all kind of the same thing. So how do you like work through with the amount of work you're pushing out and the way you are with the conventions, how do you work through burnout? How do you work through like not wanting to give up and just toss in the towel sometimes? And how yeah. have you kept on going these last few years? I mean, <clears throat> I've never considered giving up because I know I, I can't. I can't do that. I, I know that it, at all times, it is so essential in my nature that I am going to be writing stories, whether I'm, you know, mentally, whether I'm making them or not. And I have the choice to either let them build up in my head and leave no room for anything else. Or I have the choice to make this my career and, you know, make the right. Making comics is, a, is an act of exorcism. Like you have to get this out of your head. You know, yeah. and like in many cases, when it's done, 
I don't ever really think about them again unless they become like really popular or, you know, I want to consider a sequel or something or, you know, I want to like pitch it to Netflix or something crazy like that. And then I go back into the headspace of, okay, I remember what it was thinking about this character in this world all the time. But for the most part, when you're done, that's just more room on your hard drive, so to speak. And it, it makes that space for you. So I, I know that I can't quit. That's not an option I've ever had. I have to make it work because there's not, I don't have, and I don't have any other skills either. (laughs) I'm one of those people that I'm really good at a couple of things and most of them aren't useful at all. And, um, I mean, this is literally my college degree. What am I going to do? You know, so I, I, I don't, there's, there's a certain beauty in, you know, the cautious people always tell you when you go to college, have a plan B and the passionate people always tell you, you can't have a plan B because you'll use it. And I'm as much as I like caution and, and planned out uh, living, I am, I am actually in the, in the no plan B category. So I'm sorry, I forgot the question because I went I, off. On I totally spaced out because I thought of like five more things to say to what you were saying. To yeah, yes, to, right. Yeah, no. It's uh, it's so true though. I mean, when I was when I was 18, and this was like before when people were still like scared about tattoos and being in a work environment. I went and got like right. my first tattoo like on my forearm, and I'm like, this guarantees that I can't have a regular job. Um, also, right. it says fuck on it. Like I I've, I have a tattoo at 18 year olds that says fuck. You know what I mean? Like stuff like oh, that. Oh like, my, right? is that even legal? And so like, I was like, you know, I have no other option. Like, and I was just like, whatever I do, it has to be along these lines. Cause now no one's going right. to, now the rules, the rules like changed like four years later and nobody give a fuck about tattoos. Right. But it was one of those things. Like I set myself up on like, I'm not really good at anything else. And I can't really pay attention enough to anything else to like even succeed mm-hmm. in that. Like, I don't think I could have ever been a doctor or a lawyer or like gone into like finance or anything because you know what? If I don't care about something, I tune out. Like I just cash out completely and I can't mm-hmm. force myself to do it. Um, I could probably like wiggle my way through some stuff and like be okay and figure it out, but I wouldn't be right. truly happy. And you have to do what makes you happy and what you can go in every day and be like, you know what? No matter what, I can do this. Even if it's scary, right. Like art, art gets scary to sit down and do and push out, but there's no better feeling than when you're working on the process or when you finish it. And I don't know anything else that I could be doing this for because I just wouldn't be able to pay attention. I would just suck at it, to be honest. I'd be horrible at life at that point. Right, right. Yeah. Now, are you you a process creator or a product creator? Um, I'm very much probably more a process creator over time. Mm -hmm. I've become that because... I, you know, one of those things that you have to really learn is like, you have to love the process to like even finish the product, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've really realized that like, yeah, I was hyped for, you know, the punk anthology and all this stuff to come to life. And I'm so hyped they're in my hands. But as soon as they're in my hands, I'm like, this is cool. I want to get back and make you more, you know, like I want to turn around and just start doing like, I'm happy it's there. I'm happy it exists. It's in my hands. Cool. But like, I have like eight other comics that I have, like that are just on cue to be put out and I'm already moving on to my next steps. And I'm so yeah. excited to move on to the next steps that the process is just the yeah. best part. And if I know if I don't love that, then I'm not in here yeah. for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's another, that brings up another thought. Like I, I relate to that because like, um, one of the other reasons I know I have to be doing this is like, I've, I timed it at one point, And this was many years back when my you know, my manners were much more frenetic in this department. I've, I've been able to bring my mental health down to a much better place, but, um, it was something like, I can't go seven minutes without a project. Like I could complete an entire comic or it would be something like in school, you know, finish an assignment. Cool. It's done. Seven minutes within seven minutes would be like, I have to start working on something like I have to have a project. I have to have at least one project and I have to be working on it or I'm just not, I'm not at peace. And once I start, you know, once I'm actually working on it, there's still the pressure of, I want this to be good. I want this Mm -hmm. to be, you know, as, you know, as fast and efficient as possible, mostly good, but you know, efficient too is good. Getting to the end, it helps, but it's still like in as much as there are those pressures, it's still much more peaceful than not working on a project. Mm -hmm. Plus it's one of those things where like, I spent so long in like, especially in my life, trying to figure out like, how do I make comics? How can I even break into comics? How do I find an artist to work with me? And how do I even start doing all this? 
that, you know, I would hate to let any of this go at this point. Like you craved it for so long and you finally get the chance to do it and it's finally coming to life and you're seeing your work, you know, it physically in your hands come to fruition and collaborating. Like how mm -hmm. could I ever even stop when it's the only thing you ever wanted in life? Like right. it's just like right. grabbing a fruit and just tossing it and being like, ah, it was whatever, you know? And like, no, that's not the All way right, this works, right. you know? Um, right. But I, I totally agree. I literally finished a script um, for China for fake your death this week. And I was like super hyped because I was putting it off for a while. Cause I had to get in like mm -hmm. a headspace to write it. And then right. as soon as I finished it, I was like, Oh, cool. I'm excited because I have another script that I've been like kind of boiling and I get to now switch right. my focus to that. And now that's what right. I'm going to do today. And it's like, I need right. to be doing something in some aspect yeah. or I'm going to go crazy because I don't know where else yeah. to put my energy or mental. I think I would just break at a certain point. Yeah. I really think if, I, if like, if I couldn't do this, I would just dig holes all day or something. Like I would just yeah. have yeah. to, like, you have to have a project. That's just the way it is for me. Yeah. And it's, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's weird because if that's kind of why I drifted into writing and, uh, and going into like art as well, because I realized mm -hmm. like I could only write so much before I'm just like twiddling my thumbs waiting for art to come in. And then I'm right. like, well, you know, why don't I just start working on this as well? Building skill sets. Like when you become an artist, literally it's never ending at this point. There's always something to work towards there's always something yeah. you get better at and yeah. so if you don't if you're bored as like a creator or you're not trying to advance your skills somehow you're kind of just making excuses because it's like it's like kind of kids who have like a, an awesome video game system and they're like you have nothing to do but like you have the outside you have this you have all this you have a million games like there's mm -hmm. something to do there's no reason to yes. say you're bored um yeah. art, same thing i'd rather just be figuring that out and yeah. trial and error it you know Right, but I think that right. instant gratification culture we've slowly become to has hurt a lot of people and artists because they just want, they see what they see in big publishers and they're like, right. I want to be at that skill set. And they start yeah. drawing and you're like, oh, I have to work towards this. Right. Oh, I have to work towards this every day. Oh, I have to put how many hours right. to kind of get good and master this. Like, right. that's what I think right. stops a lot of people from even discovering how good of artists they could really become. Yeah. And how gratifying it can be. Yeah. That's a, like one of the comments I get most often on my Instagram posts, my, my FAQs is like, are basically comments about like, essentially along, along the lines of like, wow, I would never have the patience to do that. And it's, it, it always makes me really, really sad. Um, because a patience is an incredibly learnable skill. It's yeah. very easy to, to, teach to your brain extremely easy your brain is is very plastic you can teach it new things imagine that and the other thing is like i don't think they even mean patience i think they mean focus because like patience what patience means is you're you're enduring something unpleasant i'm not enduring something unpleasant you're yeah. implying by saying that i'm that i have so much patience that i can do this means i hate my work i don't like i mm -hmm. want to do this like if you're, you mean you're focus, patient while you wait sure. at a doctor's office, you're patient while exactly. you wait at a red you're, light. You're patient, you know? <laughs> you're patient while your bratty nephew is like doing the, <laughs> the thing at you and you don't hit him, you know, like that's patience. Um, but yeah, what I think they mean is focus. And I, what I think they often mean, what I think they're often doing is that mental excuse is like, well, this requires a skill I don't have that I've never tried to have. So that's why I can't do this. Woe is me you know, and it makes me so sad because like you absolutely can, you absolutely can. Yeah. hundred percent. Huh. I mean, uh, Apollo, when we were just doing the podcast, I started a live drawing show so I could learn how to draw. And right. it was one of those things where I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like I got to figure out a way to start the skill set. And mm -hmm. every day I would just jump on the live stream with my friend Danny. And for like two to four hours, you know, every Thursday night, we would just draw, we do a spinner and just figure it out. And it's like, you just set aside the time and just, you sit down and do it. And you just like, yeah. don't complain. And you'll, you'll realize like what doors open up once you sit down and do it. Yeah. And sure, you know, it might check your phone every three minutes and whatnot. And, but just like keep shifting back, like, don't let it go. And people yeah. just want to be like, Jim Lee and Tony Daniel and Jason Fabuk right out right. of the gate when it's just like, right. no, dude, like experiment right. with your style. Why do you think there's so few of those people? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. No, for reals. Yeah. They put yeah. in the time and they like endured it. And you know, it, yeah. it, it kind of like there's moments it might suck, but that's 
anything in life. You know, I grew up right. playing bass for, you know, the first like essentially 25 years, you know, for 14 years, I was playing bass and studying music. And, yeah. you know, there were some days I played great. And some days I'm like, I can't even figure out how strings work for some reason. And that, right. that's how it goes. You, but you work through it. You understand that. And you, you, and you have days like that even as a pro. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. have days where I get to the drawing table. And it's like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I've been doing this for years, you know. And oh, the other thing. Oh, no, go ahead. I would say you know, when you talk about patience too, I think people look at the intricate detail that you put into your work too. Mm -hmm. And I think that intimidates a lot of people. It's because you're very fine with like awesome yeah. designs and details and aesthetic. And I think that's beautiful. But you know what that takes is a lot of time and, you know, sitting down and figuring it out and like playing mm -hmm. with things and knowing how your pens work and experimenting with like your tools and your craft. Um, yeah. That just takes yeah. time and just, you know, investment, you know, like how yeah. much are you willing to invest into it to figure out these little intricate right. things? Right, right. And I mean, yeah. And the other thing I always think about, you know, when the patient's comment comes up is like, look, your day is 24 hours long, no matter how you spend it. You may as well do it, do something valuable, you know, yeah. like it doesn't take any more patience in the literal sense to spend eight hours watching Netflix and it does to spend eight hours drawing. Right. It's the same amount of attention, you know, like it's not, it's, it, that's why the patient's comment frustrates me so much. Cause it's like, you're talking about something else. You're, you're making yeah. an excuse. I worry that you're making an excuse. And you know what? Put on Netflix while you draw. If that makes you feel better, like, and you know, sure, do, you that. Get done, yeah. like, do that. Like, you know, put on the show so you're not missing out on whatever, you know, people are talking about, but eventually you're going to learn like, you could just shut it off and be happy in your own yeah. world too. You don't need to yeah. have 12 things happening around you at once. You don't need to be in sync with the whole world who demands, you know, everything's streaming right, right. now. Everything's available right. right now. Doesn't mean you need to do it all right now. You know, like enjoy right. that, savor it, right. save that Netflix right. binge when you just like give yourself a day off from everything. Right. Yeah. And it, you'll enjoy it a lot more too, to be honest. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Like, don't be what I'm really learning now that I'm starting to be old <laughs> is it really it really is bad for your brain to be so overstimulated all the time. And like I have I spend so much less screen time than I used to. Um, I, I, you know, I'm very intentional about focusing on just one thing at a time, you know, even just the multitasking is like, look, if I have a list, I don't have to think about it. That's mm -hmm. why I'm such a list person. And I'm just trying to be good to my brain, just like think about one thing at a time. And that's honestly really been helping. I'm at a point in my process where when I'm penciling, I don't, I get this question all the time. Like, what do you listen to while you're working? Like, it's an assumed thing when I'm penciling, it's just silence. Like it's just me working because all my attention is going to the work, which is where I want it. Now, mm -hmm. inking is a kind of different thing. I often listen to like podcast or music or something while I'm inking, but there's way fewer decisions being made at that. And, you know, at that point, you've already decided how it's going to look. You just now have to do it, you know? Kind of like a, inking is, I always feel like it's more of a vibe. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I need to like have something to go with it. Um, in the sense of like, you could kind of be a bit more free, but a bit more strategic at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like your map is already there. You're yeah. just trying to fill in the blanks and like, you know, add to it a whole lot more. Um, yeah. And I think people, I mean, it's one of those Kevin Smith chasing Amy jokes where people think like mm. inking is just tracing when it's like, it's so much more to that, but you kind of like loosen yeah. up your brain a bit more because your, your armature, your frame is there. You, you're just right. like elaborating on it. You're just bringing it to yeah. life even more. Yes. But like yeah. the pencils where the focus is and where you're trying to really map out this empty world. Yeah, I take some folk. And sometimes that's the most intimidating stage is like, yeah, pencils, page. I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. How, how's your how's your process when you're creating, you know, like, where do you start from stage A to like actually finishing a product or finishing a page up to there, at least? So if I'm working for myself, technically, the process starts years in advance of actually drawing anything where I just let the story percolate for a long time. And then I write it, I script it. Um, and then I thumbnail it. Thumbnailing is the most important part. Thumbnailing, I tell people, is what making comics is. Everything after that is just different kinds of drawing. Um, so the thumbnailing is the big part. I work everything out in the thumbnails, the perspective, everything. I recently added breakdowns, which is like a stage in between pencils and thumbnails, which you think it would make it take longer, but it actually is shorter, which is slightly larger. Thumbnails, I work at about this size mm. a page breakdowns i work a little bit larger and it's basically where i really lock down 
the forms. So a finished breakdown is basically a lot of, you know, naked mannequins, shapes of buildings, things like that, where I make sure everything works correctly. I have the anatomy right. I have all that. Then in pencils, I, okay, and I scan that in, I print that out in pink line on a penciling board. And then in pencils is more about the details. I put clothes on the figures. I put, you know, bricks in these walls. I, you know, mm. do do all the detail kind of work, do all the final passes. Um, there's no more naked mannequins at that stage. Scan that in, print that out in blue line on inking board. And then I ink that. And, uh, and I usually print the panel borders as well, digitally. That's one thing I just find saves time and I like them better pristine because I'm that nice. kind of person. Um, when I know that, scan that in, and then I can do whatever letters or screen tones or colors are going to happen. And then I uh, compile a document, a print document, and send it off to you guys pretty much. Brad, that's super cool. I think that process, you know, it's going to be fun to dive into that, that live drawing show that we're starting up and everything. Cause I love seeing cool. that process, even from like how you're using pink line, you know, that's something I don't hear too common with a lot of creators. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that just help you like essentially just kind of vision everything step by step a bit more? It's just a, a vital part of you kind of like how people use blue line pencil at that point. Well, and I'll tell you exactly why I use it. Cause I use, I use blue line for inks mm -hmm. and I use pink line for pencils and uh it's literally just to balance out my printer expenses oh, there you go yeah it's a win <laughs> honestly yeah what and do you do a lot of your printing at home what was that you do a lot of these prints at home and everything too like yeah i have like i've gone through a series of combination printer or scanner printers they have mm -hmm. to be the big ones because they have to accommodate 11 by 17 but yeah you get a good ink inkjet printer for your home studio um that'll take care of a lot of your your needs because basically as much as i am technically a traditional artist it's really more of a synthesis because when i you know when i scan in my thumbnails when i scan in my breakdowns when i scan in even my pencils there will always be digital edits it's like oh that's a great head it just needs to be a tiny bit smaller mm -hmm. or it's like you know or this just needs to be slightly to the left or i just need to, or this just this panel the drawing whole the whole drawing got a little big just shrink it a little bit inside you know just scale it inside of the panel board or stuff like that so it is sort of a synthesis of traditional and digital in that i can manipulate whatever i need to before proceeding to the next step and that saves me a lot of time in penciling and you know thumbnailing stages as well mm. because i don't have to keep redoing things till they're the right size if it's okay just the wrong size or slightly to the left or whatever i can fix that that's easy nice that totally makes sense i love hearing that yeah. that's super cool um everyone's process as a creator is just so distinct and different and i love picking up yeah. those cues from everything because it's like there's no wrong way it's about figuring out what works best for your process and like you said mm -hmm. it takes a lot of experimenting it takes a lot of like you know switching out you know one aspect for another and seeing if that combo works but uh nailing it down and make it more like fluent for you and you know so you can work faster so you could kind of get more work done and clarity in your head as you're telling mm -hmm. the story that's yeah. the best avenue to go. I mean, Rick Lopez was just telling me that he templates all of his pages first and he has all the borders laid out and it's just easier in his brain to work with that function. And like, yeah. at least he's playing with panels and just manipulating images at that point. And I'm like, that's yeah. brilliant. Just like printing yeah. out a bunch of pages with your panels laid out and you work from there. Like that's a cool, mm -hmm. whatever frees up your brain to be yeah. like getting rid of those mundane tasks to make it easier to put the yeah. art on the page. Yeah, for sure. Dude, that's so cool. Um, man, honestly, I didn't even realize we just hit an hour on the conversation too. So, oh my will, gosh, we did! I'll, wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll cap it there for now because um, I could go okay. on for another hour talking to you about great and amazing stuff. Um, and we didn't even get to dive in on like your struggles and like how like rewarding some of this stuff is. All sorts of like typical questions I ask, but I love your your viewpoints on how you approach conventions and how it is to balance like life as a creator because I think that's what we struggle with the most is you know, how do I make my life, you know, fit, you know, reality and survive, but also right. like produce the art that I crave and I really want to produce, like you, yeah. holding yourself back because life and reality is heavy and because the world exists, it's such a bad reason to not make art, you right. know, and it can be overbearing and it can be rough, but like breaking through that and realizing like, I need to make my art no matter what that's right. like what it's all about and that's the most right. rewarding part and it seems like yeah. that is probably like one of the biggest lessons i got from you today is just like go yeah. out there and make your art like it's going to yeah. make you happier than if you don't <laughs> to be honest yeah 
don't be your own enemy. Your brain's going to want you to be your own enemy because your brain's job is to keep you safe and comfortable, but your brain doesn't understand long-term goals. So true. Honestly. Yeah. Your brain really doesn't understand long-term yeah. goals. It's your brain very lives short-term. moment to moment. Yeah. Think about it. You know, comic book paneling. Yeah, there you go. Moment to moment versus like the other Scott McCloud references. That's a great way to like think about how your brain operates, to be honest. Yeah, I love that. Um, Dude, this has been great. Thank you so much for just like taking the time and chatting and like just giving us some insight and inspiration on your process. I really do appreciate it. I'm so honored that you liked it. Yeah, it was a really good time. This was really fun, dude. Um, Why don't you tell the audience uh, where to find your work and what you're going to be up to for the rest of 2024? Okay. Well, um, I am Clara Meath. You can find me on Instagram at Clara underscore Meath. My logo is a little CM, so you can't miss that. Um, I have a store envy shop, Comics and Art by Clara Meath, I believe. But you know, honestly, if you just Google my name, it's a nice rare enough name. That's the beauty of it, that uh, you can find my stuff. Google Clara Meath Art and you'll be fine. Um, uh, you can also buy things directly off my Instagram. You can buy things uh, from Comics Experience Publishing. That's CEX. I have several uh, comics available through them. Um, all, please feel free to hit me up on any of those platforms. I, I love getting feedback from folks. And what was the rest of the question? <laughs> um, what you're going to be up to for 2024? Any oh, conventions okay. or anything? Releases that uh, that? If all goes according to plan, I will soon be kickstarting a perspective course, which will include options for a video course and and or a book. So you you should have you'll have basically three different options there for how you want to pursue it. If you want to learn how to draw perspective, I can break that down for you very simply, very understandably in, you know, six to 12 minute videos like seriously i think there's like 12 or 13 of them we're gonna be um that's at least the plan right now we'll see how it breaks down when it comes to the actual editing but there will be multiple short videos each one with you know specific lessons in them and if you've ever been intimidated by perspective or you don't even understand what perspective is and you know there's something wrong with your drawings and you can't figure out what it is i can tell you right now it's perspective so if you want to look into that uh, i would be honored i would be really deeply honored if really anyone uh, any aspiring artist were helped by this course so i'm very excited to get it out so keep an eye out for that so exciting be sure to tag cws so i can make sure i'm reposting that on our social media because i love i think that's going to help a lot of creators out there and especially even creators like me i'd love to back that and get some insight on that type of stuff so that's super exciting that you're working on i'd love that thank you super red Claire, thank you so much, dude. This has been so much fun. I can't wait to bring you back on the show. And I can't bring can't wait to bring you onto our live show. Um, we're gonna be doing spilled ink starting in May. Uh, so it's gonna be me and Max Flowers and Evan McGuire kind of hosting it and bringing on guests to learn to help me learn how to draw and then just talk shop, talk more craft. And then we all get to draw stuff for the whole day. And it's super fun. So cool. super can't wait to get you on that at some point once we launch it. But I appreciate your time and everything you've been doing and all your hard work. Um, I can't wait to like meet you and like get some books in my hands as well to support your stuff. Uh, Super fun. Um, But for all of our listeners and watchers and subscribers, don't forget, you know, we're coming out with episodes twice a week again, and we have a whole bunch of new content coming your way. Uh, And if this is airing after free comic book day, we'll have the inspired ink anthology out and available where you guys can get it um, digitally through our newsletter and so many more exciting things coming your way. So stay tuned for all the announcements. Um, and don't forget, you could always reach out on our social media if you have any questions about any of your orders, any help, anything at all to make your experience with Comics Well Spring better and easier. Um, but for now, stay creative, stay inspired, and thanks for hanging. Looking for high quality printing, fast turnaround, and the industry's best customer service? Look no further than Comics Well Spring. Trusted by thousands of indie comic creators, Comics Well Spring is proven to be the go to comic book printer. So when you're ready to bring your comic books to life, go to comicswellspring.com and be sure to check out one of the best platforms to sell your physical and digital comics online, the CWS Bookstore. Remember to subscribe, hit that notification bell to see our lives come out twice every single week on YouTube and podcast platforms. And also tag us when you share your favorite episodes and moments from the show. And remember creators, thanks for hanging, keep creating and stay inspired.